Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free trial at www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co slash PMC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Do me a quick favor. If you like what you hear at Planet Microcap, please take two seconds to give us five stars on Spotify or Apple. This helps with the search engine so that more folks can also discover and engage with all things microcap. Quick note, if you missed any of the content from the Planet Microcap Showcase Vegas, I've uploaded all the keynotes, panels, and webcasts from the event to our YouTube channel, so be sure to check that out. And uh, as I mentioned now for the last couple of weeks, our next event will be the Planet Microcap Showcase Vancouver, taking place at the Fairmount Waterfront on September 6th and 7th, 2023. For more information to register, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vancouver. Now, my guest on the show today is Travis Prentice, CEO and CIO of EAM Investors. I was introduced to Travis by Doug Porter from Acuitas Investments. Thank you, Doug. From Travis's time working as managing director and portfolio manager with Nicholas Applegate Capital Management, his experience with Russell uh, in the midst of them building out the microcap index, as well as EAM strategy using what he describes as informed momentum, I think you're in for a treat. So thank you again for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Travis Prentice. Travis, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, uh, shout out to uh, to to the Doug from uh, Acuitas for introducing us, and I think it was a good idea for us to chat. And then when we chat, I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. This is a good idea. You know, we're a uh, couple microcap uh, knuckleheads in the microcap space. <laughs> like, why not? So, yeah, uh, exactly. And I, yeah, I've known Doug for, gosh, it would be over a couple decades now. Or yeah, Doug Porter. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a long road. Oh, that's for sure. That's for sure. Well, we have a lot to talk about because you, uh, the, you know, you guys have a white paper out there about the opportunity in U.S. microcaps. You know, you have an extensive career um, investing in microcaps uh, on the institutional side. So I mean, I, I figured we'd start there because when we were chatting last week on your experience and we were talking about benchmarks and you know we have our you know our little index here at planet microcap how we use things and we were kind of chatting through that so kind of wanted to start there and your experience uh, correct the name of the firm that you were at when you were when russell came to you guys what was that called again yeah i started my career at a firm called nicholas applegate that's right in 1997 that's right so tell us a little bit about that experience being kind of the you know, one of the few buy side firms really having a strategy in microcap, and then also what it was like when the Russell came to you and were thinking about creating this kind of strategy because I, I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, we, we, my career goes back to about twenty six years now of investing in microcap stocks. Back when uh, we used to call them mini cap stocks, so before <laughs> micro was a thing, I guess uh, when micro was mini uh, back then. But yeah, uh, I worked at a firm, Nicholas Applegate, that was really a pioneer in small cap investing. And because of that, as the meaning of small cap kind of increased, the, the companies got much larger. And from a market cap perspective, uh, they launched something called mini cap. And so we were one of the only, you know, maybe there was a handful of other institutional asset managers uh, playing in that space of micro. So, uh, you know, as you know, Russell has been, uh, you know, the index provider that's kind of defined the institutional asset management place as far as benchmarks go. And there was only a handful of us doing it. So they actually came to us and said, well, what does this mean? What does it look like? What kinds of stocks are you buying in the first place? Because we'd like to uh, develop an index based upon what actually managers were doing in the space. Absolutely. So, I mean, at that time, you know, what 
I'm not names specifically, but I mean, what was, what was the, I guess, how did the conversation evolve to where, I mean, did they actually take some of the stuff that you were also telling them about and use that to construct the index? Yeah, absolutely. What more just like the, the definition. So what market caps are you buying? What defines, what's the difference between small cap and micro cap? So um, at the time, um, micro cap was more, you know, call it 500 million and below in terms of what we were doing on the in, in the institutional space. Uh, now the weighted average cap of the micro cap index is almost a billion. <laughs> so it's, it's changed quite a bit from when we were having those discussions in about 2003, 2004, before they launched the Russell Microcap indexes, I believe in 2005. You can chat GPT and check me on that one, but I think it was <laughs> yeah. 2005. They had they had history going back, I think, to the year 2000, but it was formally launched uh, around 2005. Why do you think it was important for them, even at that time, to really have a set benchmark for like what the average market cap should be for an index like this? I think it was from demand from uh, institutional uh, asset owners because there were managers uh, that had products like like our firm and that back then they were really the measuring stick in terms of seeing if if active managers were truly adding value so creating i think the microcap index was to satisfy the demand from asset owners but also to create a new product obviously from a business perspective at russell i wonder if things would have been different if like the the let's say the average market cap was like what folks who are listening they're hearing a billion they're like uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a micro cap. You know, like most of us define it as even today, 300 million in market cap or less. So I wonder if things would have been different if, I don't know. It, it's just, it's an yeah. interesting, it's an interesting prospect. Cause like, you know, you, you invest a little bit on the, you know, on the lower side, you know, you have potential outsized returns versus, you know, um, maybe even some of these a little bit larger micro caps or so to speak. So I'd be curious if, that change, how that changes, th- that choice right there changed the landscape for where we are today. Yeah, I think it, I think it could have, but I think it also just reflects where the market was at the time, um, because yeah. obviously as an index provider, they're extremely rules-based. And so if you look at what they did to create the Russell Microcap Index was they took the, the bottom 1,000 companies in the Russell 2000 and then added another 1,000 to make that micro. So I think it's partly the timing, but partly just in terms of what the marketplace looked like at the time. But I think it's important to remember that their definition of microcap and in the institutional space doesn't include um, over-the-counter or pink sheets. It's just the microcap portion of the market that trade on major exchanges. And then they have some liquidity requirements. They have um, stock price requirements and things like that that kind of cut off the, the very, very low end. Um, so I think it's partly just due to timing and those discussions, but also just what the marketplace looks like when you look at public companies. Do you think there's room for a new benchmark in this respect? Or if not, you know, what would maybe be some of your critique for using this as a benchmark today? I mean, these are, they got to adjust these rules a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think... Uh, Look, there's always room for improvement, and I don't think any index is is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I think it gets down to what they're trying to accomplish in the first place. But I do think the evolution of capital markets is such that uh, innovation needs to happen everywhere, and, and indexes would be included in that. And so when we think about microcap and we see the upward market cap migration of what microcap means these days, as, as opposed to it was 20 years ago, that I think offers opportunity for new indexes, but also new products. So for example, um, we have at EAM Investors a product that we call Microcap, which is kind of within the range of the Russell Microcap Index is how we define it. Um, But we also launched a product that we call Ultra Microcap. And this was way back in 2005, actually, at our predecessing firm, which we still manage today in our firm. And that just went down to the bottom half of securities that were found in the Russell Microcap Index. So going back to the roots of micro, but really back to the roots of small cap. So small cap, the Russell 2000 in the 80s, the middle 80s when it came out, the weighted average cap of the Russell 2000 was around 250 million in market cap. Right now, the weighted average is 5 billion, I think. Um, So this kind of capital markets evolution, I think, provides opportunity for new indexes and, and new investment approaches. 
hundred percent. Let's talk more about that. The, the ultra micro cap strategy. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thesis there. Some of your criteria. Cause I, I think I've, I just have a sneaky suspicion that your ultra micro cap is where most of my audience probably uh, lives. <laughs> Maybe yeah, we're, we we kind of target that. Uh, call it three, four hundred, maybe five hundred million on the very top and below. So so yeah, depending on you know everyone has their own definition, but yeah, nice yeah. So uh, I mean, tell us about the strategy, the germination yeah. of it. You know how you go about assessing new potential ideas, talking with management. You know the whole bit. Yeah, absolutely. So i mean the idea of, of ultra micro cap was really just kind of what we were talking about just go back to the roots of what small cap used to mean and so it wasn't we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel we were trying to go back to the wheel basically <laughs> but what we found um in that marketplace was obviously a rich universe of stocks and and so if you think about the those bottom kind of bottom half of market caps you find in the russell micro cap index it's you know about two thousand companies um, it's about a hundred, you know, around 200 billion in total market capitalization. And just in micro cap in general, if you just look at the opportunities within the U S stock market, you're talking about a, over 60% of the companies that trade on major exchanges in the United States are actually micro cap companies. Now they only make up about two to 3% of the total market cap, <laughs> but from a stock by stock opportunity perspective, the U S market looks like micro cap, right? Over 60% of those stocks are micro cap. So obviously a, a massive universe. And so how we approach this universe because of its sheer size is systematically. And so overall, what we accomplished at EAM Investors is harnessing the power of momentum to produce alpha. So we're looking at this universe, looking every single day for the signals, momentum signals that point us in the direction of a company that is on uh, a much better path uh, than it has been in the past. And so for us, what we're looking at is companies that have rationale, have some reason why there's momentum. And then we decide whether you know there is actually reasons and rationale why this momentum can persist. Oh, man. I, I, let's dig into that more because I think every CEO I've talked to recently, even if they produce good earnings, like, why is my stock down? I don't know. <laughs> so love to get your perspective on, I guess, the idea generation portion of that, of this Momo, I'm going to call it Momo, the Momo, strat <laughs> the Momo strategy in, in 2023. Because like I said, almost, it's almost been across the board. Like every CEO has been like, yeah, report good earnings. But of course, it's like everyone just sees it as a selling opportunity right now. So love to get your take there. Yeah, and it goes to the point of why we start with momentum in the first place. Not only, obviously, is it a factor that pays uh, over the long term. In fact, it's one of the best paying factor premia in equity markets, whether it's micro cap, small cap, or large cap. So it's a good pond efficient at the at, at at first for any any stock you're looking at. The reason we focus on momentum over and above that, though, is if you think about what you just said in terms of you know reactions to quarters or what have you. It really doesn't matter what you think about a company. It matters what the market's thinking or beginning to react to. And so why momentum works so well in microcap is just the sheer size of the universe. You have to, uh, we believe you have to have, when you want to invest, you want to invest in that point of time when the business is doing well, the stock price is being recognized. Um, and so the market's beginning to uh, discount something. And so that increases your probability of success. So you're not sitting there wondering, why, why doesn't everyone else know about this company? Why aren't they seeing what I'm seeing? And it doesn't really matter. It matters what the market thinks, not each, each individual person about that company they own. So it's that nexus of when the market begins to recognize something, that's probably the more optimal time to initiate a position. Absolutely. So I mean, are, in terms of your process, the day-to-day -day basis, are you just kind of seeing, all right, what's you know where's the action at today let's look at the stock let's see why uh, okay not really justifying that like not throwaway pile but you just kind of like all right uh we'll wait till the next yeah. time that potentially happens absolutely I so i mean the, so our investment approach we call it informed momentum which okay. basically takes the concept of momentum investing and makes it better so we believe momentum works 
But we also believe momentum works better when there's reasons or rationale behind why a company and a stock price is doing well. And then the last thing we believe in terms of informed momentum is risk management. So to answer your question directly, you know, we start with momentum. So we have systematic processes in place and we do this every single day, um, country by country, um, because we do manage global assets as well. So U.S., non-U.S., emerging markets. And so we're scouring the universe and capturing all these momentum signals that point to us that point in time with that inflection point where we need to pay attention to this particular security at this particular time. And so that's the start of it because we think you have to have a, a systematic process to go through the 3000 plus companies yeah, just in the U S yeah. 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 So you can't know everything about every single company every single day. Um, and so it's more important to us about it's obviously what you know, but it's when you know it, I think mm -hmm. is really important. And that's what the systematic process allows us to do. So once we, you know, have the yield from that and it's, and it's a daily process, then we move into um, the analyze phase, which is where we actually build that rationale to pick the best stocks that have reasons for that momentum. Mm -hmm. And so we, we look for as new products, um, you know, innovation and reinvention. So companies with new management teams, transformational M&A are just industry mar market dynamics changing uh, the, the profit potential for this company. No, I find this fascinating because like I said, we have our index and one of the things that I use sometimes when I'm looking at potential companies, maybe to do an interview with, or, you know, have on the podcast is similar things, right? Is, all right, why is the stock either popping or getting destroyed today? Like what is, what's the reason why? You know, and so I I, I I use those types of momentum. I won't say momo anymore. Those types of <laughs> momentum. So momentum just, sounds much more uh, dignified than sounds momo. Like, well, Bobby says momo. Robert, <laughs> Robert, it's it's momentum. Yes, right? yes, exactly. <laughs> but uh, you know, so so I I I think very similarly in that sense from just like a media side of things. Like, well, okay, well, what is the market finding interesting right now about? whatever it is, this company, this news or what have you, you know, I just find it fascinating though, then from your end, like, okay, now we're going to do the deep dive analysis due diligence. I mean, how long does that process and what type of analysis do you do once you see like, okay, it, this meets all of our, our idea generation criteria, but now we're going to go and do our deep dive and, you know, potentially start looking at maybe building a position here because you never know. So this micro cap, sometimes like the stock will pop, they're announcing a shelf and then, you know, you know, down the next day. But uh, again, yeah. that might not be that big a deal if, you know, you're taking your time here. Yeah, absolutely. I think microcap, like as you just kind of outlined, there's a high probability of false positives, we would say, right? So companies exactly. that, that has have momentum for spurious reasons or not very important reasons or just supply and demand, right? Some Because of the liquidity in microcap or the relative lack of liquidity, uh, you could have someone excited about a stock and there's no good reason for it. It's just supply and demand, right? So um, when we do research, it's very targeted um, and it's very efficient because what we know from our research um, and others is that the moon and premium, while it's robust, it does suffer some, some signal decay. Um, so if you look at the momentum premium and how it returns, and this is the same in microcap, you generally have you know, from the formation period of called a classic 12 minus one. So, you know, 12 months minus the, the most recent month, those stocks have a strong probability of continuing to outperform, but they outperform for about nine to 10 months. So after that, you tend to see that premium of momentum fade and actually go negative after 12 months. So what that means is if you want to capture as much of the momentum premium that's apparent even in microcap stocks, you have to be efficient in your research. You have to conduct very targeted uh, research to understand you know, the very precise, specific reason why these companies are doing well. And because of that, uh, research that we do, we measure in days because we want to be extremely efficient to capture as much of that trend, as much of that alpha as possible. Um, so it's all about being efficient, but being very directed in terms of where you're spending your research hours. And we found the best microcap companies or any companies, uh, the best investments we made aren't something that no one else can figure out. It's generally right there, right in front of you. And if you do it every day and you're looking for new information, you can be right on the pulse of that new trend and exploit 
um, that alpha opportunity. So the best idea is you don't really have to spend a tremendous amount of time to figure out what's actually impacting that company. And that I think has helped in microcap because generally you're talking about one or two products. <laughs> it's not very complicated organization. So when a microcap company gets something right, it can get it really right. And it's pretty clear, generally speaking. That's that's totally fair. I I I would definitely agree with that. You know, I, it's just it, it's interesting, and I guess maybe my my the way the reason I even asked that is because especially I was just talking to an IR firm about this yesterday, where how like you know back when microcaps were absolutely ripping in 2021, you know every CEO it was like you know when their stocks are trading at their 52 week highs and you know massive premiums and you're thinking they're you know like we're sitting pretty, we don't need cash, you know, we're not going to raise, you know, none of that, you know, and here we are now, you know, 18 months later, and you know, half, half these stocks are just getting a haircut and probably need to raise money and are now having to do it at extremely dilutive value valuations, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's, so I guess that's where it's also coming from too. You know, when you're thinking about the momentum side, especially right now, because I, I it's almost, I, I wouldn't blame any microcap CEO right now if they got a pop, I'm like, oh, good, great. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's get this. Get, get it done. All right, 10, 15 million in the door. Let's go. You know, so it's it just it. So is it? It that's where my, uh, especially right now in 2023, like that's where my 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 thought came from when with that question. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the old adage, you know, that I've certainly observed over the the last 26 years in this marketplace is, you want to raise capital when you don't need it. <laughs> no, no, part of my French. No <laughs> shit, right? You would think, it's easier. Since, <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, human nature, man. As, but yeah, as, I mean, but you, but you picked out a very uh, crazy time period, and I think the early part of 2021 was probably the craziest market environment that I've witnessed since the you know the late 90s um, in the internet sock puppet days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dating myself on that, but uh, I was say, uh, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to start my career in the late '90s. So I pretty much saw every single IPO that came to the market from '97 to to 2000. So, what do you, I mean, what your momentum signals didn't show you that crypto was like this is where you needed to be? <laughs> I mean, come on, well, man. Well, no, we did capture some of that, but definitely not <laughs> all of the meme stock mania. No, we uh, we we missed out on a a, a bunch of those. Oh, bummer, dude. I'm so sorry. But we also <laughs> missed that. We also missed out on the downside, though. So, <laughs> right? Because discipline, I mean, moment, the momentum discipline is two sides of a coin, right? It's what you own. So what is trending? But at the same time, if you have discipline and it's a good momentum strategy, it's also what you don't own or when you get out. So when things break trend, you move on to where strength is. And so I think that's why you, if you look at, you know, certainly our results, but just in momentum in general, it tends to have some pretty good upside downside captures if it's done right. Absolutely. Let's talk about that right now. I mean, what, what have been some of the momentum signals you've seen thus far in 2023? <laughs> well, I, I split the world now in, um, in, in an important date. It's the pre-NVIDIA quarter the other day and the post-NVIDIA quarter. So I think the world's change rather dramatically in fact yesterday so <laughs> if you were to ask yeah. me what the what where we're, where we're seeing momentum in the u.s markets um in microcap coming into uh yesterday it would have been in areas that you wouldn't have thought and that's i think why momentum does so well because it's it's a little bit of a um we're not we're not predicting anything we're reacting to what's actually happening so home builders uh this year and going and still going have very strong momentum which i think is extremely counterintuitive <laughs> that you'd want to own home builders when interest rates uh, increase by so much, but we're seeing momentum there, but now everything is um, technology and AI. I mean, that's where we're seeing obviously new trend emerging and trends that were in place massively accelerating. I figured that's exactly what you're going to say on the AI. Side. I think we <laughs> talked about that last week. We we're like, "Hey, have you started using AI for some of your stuff?" It's like, actually, kind of, you know. You yeah, know. yeah, hey, absolutely. Man. Hey, it, it's it's pretty helpful when it's summarizing some of these, you know, research reports and stuff that we got to do. You know. Yeah, and I, and 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 look, I think I think yesterday, if you look at returns yesterday, I mean, it was one of the biggest, I think, one day divergences between large and micro. 
you know, I think large cap, depending on where you're at, we're up one to 2% and micro was down, you know, almost 2%. So it was a, a huge divergence of a trend that has been in place for, for a long time now of large cap dominance. Yeah. I got a, an experienced question for you when it comes to, you know, looking at the momentum signals and it signaling a trend and or a sector that you were like, really? this is the trend right now at this. I mean, you gave a great example just now, <laughs> even with the, with home builders like that, I would not have thought for a second <laughs> would yeah. be something that's showing strength. But I mean, in your career would have been some other uh, time periods and sectors. you like, really like this right now. <laughs> I think that's more the norm than not. Um, and I think it has to do, you know, I think anytime you're investing, if you let your ego get involved, I think it leads you astray. So, uh, you know, when you hear on CNBC or you look around, I mean, most of what investors are doing are trying to predict things that we know are not predictable. And I think that that's a very tough game. I mean, you can get it right once in a while and that can make a career. But if you want to add value consistently, I think it's more of a game of, of being an interested observer and then asking questions rather than trying to predict what the market might do or what industries might do. I mean, I think that's a losing game. So I think our discipline has always been, and it goes along with momentum, is that, you know, that adaptability of going to wherever their strength and trend, it 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 makes you not really care about whether what you think is right. It really what the market is telling you. And the market is the ultimate arbiter of arbiter of truth, right? I mean, that's everyone together from a supply and demand perspective telling you what's happening. <laughs> and so I think it's, we look at our job as more of observing and reacting rather than trying to predict. And I think when you open yourself up to that, you find trends in areas where most people aren't looking. And I think that's part of the, the value proposition. 100%. By the way, going back again, speaking to 2023, not to jump around too much here, but going back to 2023 and, and one of the biggest problems right now, especially in microcap has been liquidity, right? It's just, you know, I was joking earlier about, you know, how some stocks, you know, they announce good earnings and the stock just goes and, you know, you see a sell off. Um, but at the same time, there's also some of those stocks that will report those earnings and it's just completely to an audience to, no one cares. Right. And there's just absolutely mm -hmm. no trading in it. And, and it was a good, you know, compared to his peers, a good quarter. Right. Yep. You know, so when you're going through and looking at idea generation, you know, how does, you know, lack of volatility or just, la sorry, lack of liquidity in micro caps maybe affect the strategy a little bit? Yeah. I think you have to have a discipline in terms of liquidity. I mean, obviously in any micro cap strategy, um, especially if you're going to manage any kind of significant amount of assets. Um, liquidity is obviously extremely important because no matter how good your stock picking ability might be, if you can't get in, out, in and out of the securities uh, efficiently, you're going to erode a lot of your alpha, right? A lot of your outperformance. So um, we, we have liquidity constraints kind of built in from the get-go and so that we can transact at a low cost without and and preserve our alpha, not erode it through implementation or trading. So, I mean, everyone has their own definition of what what liquidity means, but for us, we want to be able to fully buy or fully sell our entire portfolio at full capacity within ten to fifteen trading days, assuming we're you know kind of like a twenty percent participation rate on any given day. So, from that, we we come to a stock by stock liquidity threshold. Got it. And I mean, what's your average hold time? For some of these names, yeah. So, I mean, our average hold time is about nine months, give or take. Okay. You know, six to nine months, which is the sweet spot of what we would consider that that momentum alpha creation. But that doesn't mean we don't hold on to securities for much longer than that. It's just the, from the way we approach and our investment approach, we understand that the probability of outperformance. It's 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 uh, it's always time and it's duration and amplitude of the alpha that determines whether you, how long you stay or not. Those are the two, but we know those are the two variables. But we know that the longer you hold a security, if it's doing well, the lower the prob the lower the probability as you go out ten to twelve months. Probabilities are not in your favor, and I think that has to do with uh, investor behavior. So when we buying a security with new information, those tend to be mispriced because of a, a, a lack of appreciation of the positivity of that information. So there's an initial underreaction, 
But then at the end, there tends to always be in a successful company or a successful stock, an overreaction. So an extrapolation from the current events and they extrapolate it far too long, which is a fancy way of saying expectations creep up, right? So you, you, you find a company with low expectations. No one really knows about it. They start doing well. They start getting on more radar screens. Expectations become extremely high. And that's not a good recipe for forward returns when expectations are high. So generally speaking, the longer a company outperforms, the less likely it will continue. Very good. And I mean, what? how do you evaluate management in a strategy like this? Do you even speak to management in some, in some cases? Or I would imagine for the most part, you probably don't. No, and... and, and, and- well, we, we do indirectly. I mean, we consume a tremendous amount of information. So conference call transcripts and things like that. So we're aware of what management's saying. Um, but what's more important to us is what's they're doing. And not only what they're doing, but are we seeing results from that? So from an objective data perspective, can we see what that management team is doing and how successful they are? Because it doesn't really matter what someone says. It's what we can see what someone's doing. And so we remain rather objective in terms of we want to see that grid management team that's changed practices actually see it in results, right? Because how you define a good management is probably more important the results rather than what you might think about them subjectively or what school they went to or anything like that. (laughs) But I will I'll tell you, having met with you know thousands of management teams over the years, I think what I've learned is you want to remain as objective as possible. I think that's good advice. I, you know, it's some, it's hard, you know, look, I, I interview management teams all the time is for our podcast and also short form interviews, I have them in conferences, you know, they're, I, I'm definitely in the camp of like, you, you know, you want to try and meet with management and hear what they have to say as much as possible. I'm a big believer in that. Um, I think that especially in micro cap, it's 90% minimum, you know, 90% bet on the jockey in that respect. But I also see what you're saying there because in some cases, in one camp, you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, if I'm really like, you know, you know, uh, get into it with the management and like get to know them or, or really talk to them as much as possible, like maybe there's some alpha I can gain by getting in earlier because I'm kind of think, you know, they're signaling some things that their plans or objectives or they're telling you maybe earlier than, you know, maybe you see in a conference call or something like that in a public forum, of course, you know. And maybe there's some alpha gain there, but I get, I totally understand and respect what you're saying too, is that like at the end of the day, like show us the stuff, like perform, (laughs) right? Well, well, if you think think about not only a good management team, but a good stock to own, it will manifest itself in momentum signals, right? So either, I mean, we look at momentum in both fundamental signals, but also price and volume basis signals. So whenever we talk about, hey, what does a good management look like? Well, it should be a stock that's, um, doing well, right? Guiding up estimates, surprising on the upside in terms of earnings. So that's from a fundamental momentum perspective. But also, the stock price should be outperforming, <laughs> which is what, which is the definition of momentum. So all those things culminate in momentum signals, and that's why we focus on them. But I agree with you. I mean, I think there is a proposition that if you know a company better, perhaps you can gain an edge from that. But I would also say the downside of that, though, is becoming emotional on the sell side. So once you've invested so much time, so much energy into one management team, how objective are you going to be when companies all go through cycles? And so I think that's the offset, right? Is, is when you, if you, if you become attached, I think it, it, it clouds your objectivity. And I think that's the, that's the potential downfall of, of what you're talking about in terms of for you sure. Know, and, teams. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, you're also fo- the average market caps that you're looking at are on the higher end of how we define mark- micro cap, right? So usually by that point, it's, yeah, they're still running, you know, some of them are still operators, but for the most part, they're more managers at, yep. for the most part, right? Yeah. And it's look, I've seen all scale, kinds of, you know. yeah, and I've seen all kinds of management teams. And uh, I always say, well, and we always talk about, well, you need a good product too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you you mentioned the jockey, but yeah, yeah, you need a you need a horse too. You know, you need a good <laughs> no, horse. No. So, I've seen all kinds of management teams subjectively that might not be what you consider good, but they have an extremely great product, so it doesn't really matter. 
Yeah. And then there's vice versa, right? So I think it's a combination of both those things. You got to be in the the right space, the right time with the right product, with the right management team. Right, 100%. And look, once you're going like sub 150, that's that's when you're like, all right, I got to talk to man. I, you know, I mean, especially sub 50 market, cap, like you definitely need to talk with management, right? Because that's, yeah, that's when you're getting, you know, you're getting high risk, high reward, potentially, yeah. right? You know, that, yeah. that's, that's really where... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's so many ways to add value in the market. It's just from our perspective and our approach, that's that's kind right. of the approach we take. Um, but 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 having said all that, I mean, there's so much information available to all investors these days in terms of transcripts, in terms of presentations and company websites. And, and we focus on all that information. So while we're not maybe at a presentation of a management team or in an office with them, we're consuming everything that they've said <laughs> over history and comparing it to to what's happening. So I think that's been really helpful from a microcap perspective um, over the years is just so much information at your fingertips. And listen, you're saving a little bit of overhead, you know, uh, having to make some site visits, you know what I mean? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely helped during COVID. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm sure, dude. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow, that's funny. Um, so, you know, another question that I have for you, and this goes to the white paper. When did, when was that published, by the way? Was it was in 2022? Uh, yeah, we've updated it uh, several times over the years. But, yes, I think the... Um... Yeah, I think the last paper we did was ending 2021 data. So it would have been early 22. Yep. Got it. So the, the opportunity in US microcap, right? That correct. Yep. Okay. So in, in there, you know, you you have a part about um how microcap has historically outperformed large cap, but not recently. And you know, we've talked about that a little bit on here because obviously that has definitely been the case. Um <laughs> goes without saying yeah yeah <laughs> you know it, it, we say i was saying a month ago it was 18 months maybe we're on 19 months now just you know it's it is what it is it's you been know, brutal but you know from your perspective what do you think is ultimately will be the turn is it the slower in your in your opinion like is it slowing of rates is it stopping of the rate hike i mean everyone's saying like that is the main turn signal that everyone's hoping for but I'd like to hear your opinion sure yeah, and if we just look historically, and I think the paper you're you're citing, I mean, we went back to 1927, I think, and looked at um, you know deciles of the market caps um, that are available, and we found that micro cap and small cap over that time is annualized around 12, percent and I think large cap did like 10 in that sample set. Um, however, over the last 10 years, if we even go back 10 years, more than 18 months, it's actually been flipped. So large caps actually performed at about 12 percent annualized while microcap's done seven. So it's been an amazingly brutal environment relative to larger market cap companies a little bit over 10 years, but just looking at the 10-year number is just uh, the, the, the market's been flipped over, right, from what we've seen in history. So I'm not, I'm not sure what changes that. I think, I think there's, a, there's a couple things that, that we have to square with. I think um, with what will change it, I think if you look at the the cycles of microcap just relative to larger companies, you know we like to say you come for the beta, but you stay long term for the alpha. And what that means is generally, microcap does well in recovery scenarios. And I, a lot of it's due to I think microcap tends to lead into corrections, <laughs> but it leads out of recovery. So a lot of it's kind of catch up. Um, but I also think it's supply and demand. So what will help. I think if you look at micro cap and small cap too, over the last 18 or 24 months now, I mean, we're still close to the lows in the marketplace and liquidity is kind of dried up. And so if there's any change in risk appetite, you think about all the money on the sidelines in money markets earning, you know, 5% or whatever it is now, <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of assets sitting on the sideline. And so when we see a recovery and generally the stock market will be ahead of the economic recovery, if you see that money coming in, it's going to disproportionately affect microcap stocks because of their relative lack of liquidity. So I do think when we get a recovery in the stock market, I think it's going to help uh, at least the beta. Um, but I think what we've seen over the last 26 years is the types of companies, um, and this is more existential to microcap, I think, is if you look at everything in the business landscape, the political landscape, the regulatory landscape is really, it's tough to be small these days. It seems like everything is built for larger companies and even the digitization of 
businesses everywhere, scale is so important these days. And obviously the definition of microcap is subscale. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's the more kind of existential issues facing. So if you even if you look at AI, I mean, it's disproportionately helping the uh, larger companies. And but that doesn't mean that that the downstream effects I think will be beneficial uh, to microcap companies because that's generally what happens. It starts in bigger companies, but generally small and microcap companies are suppliers or or aiding larger companies. Right. And so you know something like AI can be that that uh, signal of not only a, a market recovery and an economic recovery, uh, but also could be beneficial to uh, smaller companies if if they position themselves correctly yeah no i, I already see uh the headlines from uh you know maybe a company that was in cannabis now they're an ai company and they just raised time you know to raise time. <laughs> it, it, you're right no <laughs> well yeah and then you know and, 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 of course, but. <laughs> well but and also in the micro cap market right now i mean you have a lot of companies that um well not a not a lot but there's a, a couple of companies there that uh, were, you know, had computer rigs for Bitcoin, but it's those same type of rigs that can be used for AI. So I think there is an opportunity to pivot um, if from a Bitcoin mining operations to being uh, <laughs> help the workloads of AI with, with the rigs that they have. So probably worth exploring at a minimum. <laughs> yes. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for small companies to pivot. Um, but also the thing about microcap, which gets us all excited, and I don't know you, is that you're talking about massive markets on top of small companies. So you don't need to be dominant in any vertical to actually create a good business because there's so much money out there. There's so many niches. So all you need to do, all you need to do for microcap, it doesn't take much to really move the needle. So I think that's why it's always a spot that you, you want to be looking for that innovation mm -hmm. and picking up those ones that actually do pivot. And, you know, and, and I, Yes, agreed. And and I think another thing that we were talking about uh, last week too, and this is something that's been on my mind a lot, and I know probably most of my, the folks that are listening in too, is the one of the other, I think, more recent criticisms is like, I think everybody points to, okay, expel. That's our, that that is our, you know, it used to, it was Monster Energy or uh, it was Hanson's, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, like we had, a, we had a few shining lights, right? Of like, hey, they were microcap land, and now they're, you know, completely, you know, just made careers for so many different people. Full disclosure, I'm not a shareholder in any of those names, but that's kind of been the recent criticism. Is like, hey, we haven't really had a spell like company in a while here, you know. Like that's almost old at this point, right? I mean, there's, I'm sure there's still, you know, every, I'm not making a thesis one way or the other on yep. its potential growth, of course, but I'm just saying from where it was to where it is today and how long ago it was that it kind of broke out and now is in small cap land. We haven't really had too many of those um, that, that have experienced that same kind of, of our, I don't want to say outperformance, but performance, I guess, you know, so that's also something that I've seen. I don't know if you've seen the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's come from, I think overall, I would agree with you. Um, I do think, however, in certain segments of the economy and in microcap, um, we've seen some big winners and those have tend to be in biotech. And so it depends where you're looking, but we have seen a lot of M&A within microcap biotech. Um, but as increasingly large cap companies are outsourcing their R and D to public markets. And, and generally speaking, that's in micro cap. So I do think in biotech is an area of innovation and where we've seen big winners um, and some of the best, best and most profitable drugs have come from micro cap companies and obviously large companies acquiring them and then putting them through their sales force. <laughs> but um, you know, that's an area that, that we still see those types of stories like a monster energy or a tractor supply, right? I mean, that was a company that was one of the first companies we bought back in, in our ultra microcap strategy in 2005. So, um, or actually earlier than that in our microcap strategies, we're talking like late 90s, early 2000s. So, and then obviously that's a massive company today. Um, so I think you, you, it, it depends when you're where you're looking. I think you still find some of that. Yeah. I, I think the, I think the other thing that we have to understand and square with is the fact that. You know, venture capital and private equity are awash in so much cash that it used to be the public markets and particularly microcap 
used to fund those venture type ideas. And now by the time they, they come to the public markets, they're outside of microcap. So I think that's effectively stolen some of the, <laughs> some of the thunder from microcap um, is the, the growth of private equity and the growth of venture capital since the eighties and nineties. I mean, that's one of the biggest, you know, they, they're, they're playing with so much capital that they can fund that these early companies, whereas the public market had more of a hand in that, I think earlier. For sure. You don't see any of that changing a little bit. I think I, I thought I saw a tweet the other day where it was like, someone was saying like, yeah, this same, you know, this one deal 10 years ago, VC wise, you know, was valued at this amount and was actually generating, you know, revenue generated, not just like pre-rev kind of idea or whatever. And now today, like, that same company may, or something similar is, you know, 3X that valuation and pre-rev, you know? So some of that has to, some of that, those dynamics have to change, right? At some point, right? Yeah. Look, like I said earlier, everything is cyclical, right? Yeah. Everything is cyclical, but the difference is the is amplitude and duration, right? Like how long and, and what is it going to take to change it? And, you know, I think we've all been seeing what's going on in private equity and venture capital and, and kind of because you, you would just think theoretically that there's so much money chasing opportunities that you would have to think the returns would go down, but and and money would leave, but uh, but that hasn't been the case. So, you know, I think the other the other issue just from a public market, and this is more the institutional asset management space, I think is because large cap has gotten so big, and micro cap is still you know the bottom call it one to three percent of the market. Um, before and because of the beta returns, right? So micro cap and small cap haven't outperformed large and mid. And for many institutional investors, micro cap is an out of benchmark bet. And it's an out of benchmark bet that hasn't paid. So I think there is a strong um, behavior we see in institutional asset managers that they are actually asking for the first time in my career, why bother? Like why small cap? Why micro cap? It's it hasn't returned well. Even if I, even even if I pick the right time, it's so small that it doesn't make a difference. And so everyone's under resourced too on the asset owner side. That yep. you know I have to hire one or three managers, four managers. Now I have to you know. So it's it's almost like uh, why bother? And I think that's something that 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 could potentially hurt micro cap. But paradoxically it should help mispricing opportunities within microcap. <laughs> so it's kind of that paradox, right? It's like, well, it's, no one's doing it. It's like, well, that that should theoretically make it a great opportunity. <laughs> it's funny. Like that was what I was talking. That's what I talked about with, with Doug and Chris from Acuitas on their side, because I'm like, yeah. man, you must be like a kid in the candy store right now because you have your pick of any managers to support. I mean, you probably do it anytime, but like, especially now because the inflows are just not what they were like every across the board AUMs are down and for yeah for and strategies right and yep and and on top of that it fee compression is real and accelerating so you know you think about all those dynamics it's, it's it's definitely a tough environment to be micro cap which but then again should create a much bigger opportunity for mispriced assets because if there's less people looking Generally speaking, you should have a better opportunity to add value. I had quite a few fund managers that I, that might listen to this, and also that I talk to regularly that are like, "Dude, I've been in ninety five percent cash for you know since last year," and they're all thankful for it because they got that gunpowder to now, you know, looking at some of these mispriced opportunities. And I mean, look, it's hard to time the market, and it's you know, nobody has a crystal ball, but no, it, it's it's. It's par as you said, it's paradoxically both an absolutely amazing time to be in microcap, but also if you're kind of running more of a fund structure, like there are some, it's, it can be challenging. It's, it, yeah. it is challenging right now. No well, yeah, that. it's challenging just to be a small and microcaps uh, manager specialist. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the institutional marketplace, it used to be 1% management fee, and that would be like considered right in the middle of the road. And, right. and I would argue that it, it's, much much lower now so to create a business where you're only doing micro cap uh, it's tough it's tough because of that fee compression and and that combined with the capacity constraints that you can manage you used to be able to create a business just doing that and now it's becoming a lot tougher to do that because of the fee compression 
hundred percent. Don't worry. But listen, there's a lot of optimism we had in this interview. Okay. <laughs> we, we, I, we weren't just giving all sides, you know? Yeah. Oh, making, hey. You know? hey, well, you know, periods <laughs> of contraction are always followed by, by periods of growth. So exactly. you know, I think the way we look at it is, you know, there's, there's opportunity and look it with what we've talking about, it doesn't take much to actually move the needle in terms of flows. Right. Exactly. That will really move um you know micro cap and and we're just so we're just waiting on what that might be and i think it's recovery but i also think you know if you look at um supply chains i mean this is another thing just from an economic perspective where supply chains are coming closer to home right everyone's near shoring rather than outsourcing you know all across the globe so i do think that can provide a lot of opportunities um just from a business perspective as the us brings more of its supply home which should disproportionately help more domestic focused companies, which obviously microcap, they're much more domestically focused than, than global, obviously global companies, 100%. large global companies. And Travis, real quick, before I, uh, before I forget to ask you, you know, real, you mentioned tractor supplier, you still, do you own it at all in any of those strategies? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we, I, you've, I've taken up a lot of your time today here and we've, we've covered so much. So I, 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 I want to finish with this, you know, um, and this is a question I ask everybody on here, but I, I'd love to hear your, your answer here. What would you say is an investing experience that really changed your career in, you know, whether it's micro cap or non micro cap, you know, lo- love to hear it. Wow. Uh, good question. Um, I probably should have done more due diligence on the question you ask at the end and then I wouldn't have been surprised by it, but um I think the most formative thing that happened in my career um, is was regulation fair disclosure. And what was that early 2000s? And I think that was so important because if you look at the asset management industry prior, there was a strong, a huge opportunity for asymmetries of information, right? So if you paid enough commissions, you got information before other people did. And I think that being eliminated, that, that um, obvious um, benefit of being big really um, clouded a lot of um, talent. And so that one piece of legislation, I think, opened the door for um, hard work and talented individuals to come to the fore rather than those asymmetries I could just pay for. So the fact that now all information is disseminated at the same time to every player, I think has been extremely important, not only for institutional asset managers that are talented to come up but also for individual investors that now it's much more of a level playing field. And I think as much as you can level any playing field, the more competition you get and the better outcomes you get for, for most involved. So I think that was the biggest thing because then what happened after that is you have to have a process in place to actually add value. And so for us, that was really the birth of our process um, and the ability for us to launch our own firm was, you know, building that process to be able to add value, um, without those asymmetries very cool all right i think that's a i think that's a great place to end it right there so travis with that where can our audience go and find uh more information on you engage with you as well as more information on eam investors yeah you can go to our website eaminvestors.com uh, you can google inform momentum we actually trademark that so that's ours <laughs> so you can find us that way uh we're on linkedin i think we're soon to be on twitter so um you can find us uh over there or or even give us a call or an email that works too still yeah get on there soon man we're, we're, we're gonna publish this i gotta i gotta tag you guys but uh <laughs> yeah well that's worthwhile to point out we do put um a lot of research that we just put out in the public on our insights tab so you know like that, that white paper that you cited we we put it out there for everyone to consume we have a lot of momentum research that we do we even have monthly um equity index analysis so it's all on our website go and check it out Awesome. Well, Travis, thank you so much for joining me today. really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bobby. And have a good Memorial Day weekend. You too, man. All right. Thanks. Podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Yes.